Thank you. Thank you for coming together to celebrate the, uh, the Buddha birthday. It's called Vesak. Actually, it's called Vesaka. It's the full moon, full moon day of April in India. The real, the real day for the Buddha is called Buddha Puri, Purnima. Buddha Purnima. It's including the Buddha birthday, the Buddha enlightened, and the Buddha Nirvana passing away. Buddha Purina, Purnima. And uh, we have to ask ourselves, what did he get enlightened? What did the Buddha get, you know, enlightened under the Buddha tree? You talk about enlightenment a lot, but we don't know what he got and how he do it. And what is the motivation behind that Prince Siddhartha left home? You know, they describe him as the, the, the prince of one of, of the kind. He's called Sakya Khan. He left his kingdom, I think at the age of 29. People say he left the kingdom at the age of 19, and that is not right, because he became the Buddha at the age of 35, and he preached the Dharma in 45 years, and he passed away at the age of 80. So he must have left home when he was 29. He wandering in the forest, looking for teacher, practicing asceticism for six years, Saunam Kohan Rinya, practicing asceticism in the forest for six years, and sit, sat under the Bodhi tree for seven weeks and get enlightenment. But what is the motivation behind put Siddhartha to left home. He saw the suffering of living beings, especially human beings. He went through four gates in, in his country, and he saw birth. You know, a mother gave birth to the baby. There must be a lot of suffering for the mother, especially she must be have, she must has a lot of pain in the body. And he saw someone, someone become sick, really sick, nearly, nearly died. And he saw a very old, old person, cannot walk. Her, her back is bent, you know, and her leg is shaking, she cannot walk. And he saw a dead person, a ceremony for the dead person. So it's really striking for the prince to see this image because he never seen before in his life. All his life living in a very comfortable palace built by his father. And he was surrounded with angels, you know, prince and princess, beautiful people. He has more than enough food, luxurious food to eat and he never experienced suffering before. And this is the first time he secretly left his palace and encountered the four kinds of suffering, birth, old age, sickness, and death. I thought to my novice class, I, I told the novice, you have to question the Buddha. It is birth, suffering, or not. Obviously, birth is a lot of pain for the mother, you know, but it might not be suffering. Pain is there, but it might not suffer. So suffering is different, different kind of thing than pain, physical pain. Sometimes you have physical pain, but there are no suffering in the mind. Is that right? So you have to be very clear about suffering. Dukkha. Dukkha means a feeling of 
uh, uh, you be feeling of uncomfortable, dissatisfactory, um, malad, the state of malad, malam, jesui malad. I, I don't feel well. I'm sick. I'm terribly uneasy in my body. That is called dukkha. And there are pain, there's sometimes physical pain, but you feel very comfortable in your mind. You feel very calm, relaxed. So we have to question the Buddha. Is birth, giving birth to a baby, is suffering? Maybe suffering for most of the people, but there maybe they know there is no suffering for some people. Sometimes a kind of mixed feeling for a mother to give birth to a baby, a lot of pain, but also a feeling of pleasure. You know, kind of deep love because she's so eager to have a baby. So to give birth to a baby is something very happy for the mother. So we have to always question mark what the Buddha taught. We should not believe blindly. Is old age suffering? Maybe, yeah. Most, most of the time, people get old, they suffer a lot, especially lonely, especially a lot of pain in the body. I mean, especially when all the loved ones abandon him or her, and he was left alone, maybe suffering for old age. But maybe someone don't feel suffer, who is very old, feel very calm. After went through all experience in life, he have a feeling of you know living calmly, peacefully his life quietly his life. Spend time with nature. Take care of the garden. Take care of the plants. So old age maybe is suffering for most of people, but it's not suffering for someone. <clears throat> so birth, old age, sickness, death is office think office in life. But it could be suffering to most of the people, but it could not be not suffering for some people. So it depends on the state of mind. Depend on how we cope, we face this obvious thing is birth, old age, sickness, and death. Everybody have to get sick from time to time, right? No escape. And one day we have to die. We just had an uncle passing away the other day. His name is Bak uh, Thor. One day we have to die like him. But is that suffering or not? It depends so much on how we face this, how we live our life. So dear Mr. Buddha, we have to to change your discourse a little bit. That the bird might not be suffering. Old age might not be suffering. Sickness, illness may not be suffering. And death may not be suffering. Maybe death is happiness. The final freedom. And the Buddha also mentioned uh, that when you live with someone that you don't like, you really hate it, it's also suffering. You know, someone is uneasy to get along, always complain, radiating full of negative energy, it's also suffering. And the other kind of suffering is to abandon, you know, to live apart from someone you love deeply, dearly, is also suffering. And uh, the third kind, another kind of suffering is that you want something and you don't get it. You're not satisfied what you want. It's also suffering. 
So dukkha sometimes translates into not satisfied. You know, not you don't feel fulfilled is also suffering. Sometimes you know you have everything in life, but you have a feeling that you are not fulfilled is also suffering. Dukkha. Unsatisfactory. Not fulfilled. So it's more than a physical pain. It's very deep, very deep sense of, you know, suffering. And the last one is when the five skandhas is not working well together. It's also suffering. Five skandhas here mean the body, the feelings, perceptions, mental formation, mental activities, and consciousness. They are not working harmony together. Then it's also suffering. So to look a little bit deeper into this kind of suffering mentioned by the Buddha on the first discourse spoken by the Buddha is called Phonopuntu, something behind that creates the suffering. Of course, you know, in life, obvious, you have all this kind of thing. In life, you have, from time to time, you get sick. From time to time, you have to abandon someone you love. From time to time, or most of the time, you have to live with someone or work with someone you don't like. Especially in your office. Or especially you live at home. Or maybe in a community like this. That you don't like him and you have to live with him. That's really disaster. <laughs> so all these are obvious. The one who take care of the sound, he's not here. Can somebody take care of the sound? Where is Pop Dome? So all these uh, are obvious in life. All these are something natural in life. But the thing behind that make us suffering is actually craving and clinging to an ego, to an idea of self. So remember that. This is what the Buddha discovered under the Bodhi tree. It's clinging and craving to an idea called self. You know, an idea of self is, is uh, actually is very natural uh, belief in every human beings. During the time of the Buddha, the Brahman, they believe there's a self called, um, it called Atman. And when you practice a, to in, in, uh, in Hinduism, you practice in order to become, to unify with the Brahman. Brahman is the big self. So you are a small self and you want to join you know, to unify with a big cell, the cell of the universe, the cosmos cell, the larger body, or uh, with Brahma. Brahma is the God, the create, creator, God of creator in Hinduism. So this notion of Atman is very common belief in, in India at that time. And this notion, this belief of an ego that creates all the suffering. This body is me and I don't want to die. This body is me and I don't want to get sick. And when I get, have something, you know, pain in my body, I become to worries, you know, anxious and sometimes first uh, fall into, you know, a, a state of uh, anxiety and uh, and then you have to go to see the doctor it's create a lot of suffering so the idea the notion of atman atman or atma is so strong in us a belief there is self in me and that is the buddha discover under the body body tree that there is 
a believe the self. In this five skanda, there is governed by a, an, a self. And this self is love the body. This self is going to protect the body. It identifies with feeling and it becomes pain, sorrow, suffering. And behind them, that attachment, craving, and clinging to self is motivated by ignorance. So ignorance is actually the main cause. It's like the prisoner, the, the jailkeeper. This is very important the Buddha saw. We talk a lot. We mention a lot about enlightenment, but we don't know what is. did the Buddha get enlightened. Ignorance. Ignorance is the jail keeper. And suffering caused by attachment, clinging, craving to a self. Is a prisoner. It's a prison. So now you have to, to you see very clearly this is the prison that kept but life after life. Create a lot of suffering. From this clinging attachment keep Craving to sell, it brings to suffering. It brings to sensual pleasure. Running after sensual pleasure. It brings into the discrimination between me and non-me. The discrimination between me and non-me. saw this in his mind when he meditated. You know, he wandering around looking for teacher and he met two beautiful teacher uh, taught him meditate, meditation but he's not satisfied with that. The first teacher he, he met is Alara Kalama. This master teach him how to meditate to get into the realms of limitless space. Kung Bo Bing Su, limitless space. Second state of meditation is the realm of limitless consciousness. Thak Bo Bing Su. And this also master teach him how to meditate to get into the state of no materiality. No, you enter the state of no no matters. Vo sở hữu sự mean not, not, no, nothing there. And you know, Prince Siddhartha not satisfied with this kind of meditation. Yeah, when you enter this state of meditation, you feel so good because the limited space, just like you go into, you know, up into, into the air and you sit there, the limited space, so light. You know, you go off the, uh, the gravitational force, you are floating on the space. Yeah, a feeling so vast, so space, but Prince not satisfied with that. And limiting consciousness, only consciousness. Thak Wu Bing Su, your consciousness is space, unlimited space. Full 
of consciousness. He's not satisfied with that. And then he went to another teacher. And the next master in his name, Udaka. Udaka Ramabhuta. I'm not very good with this name. Udaka Ramabhuta. And this master teach him the meditation called the state of neither perception nor non-perception. Neither perception nor non-perception. This is so complicated. <laughs> it's more like rock. Neither perception nor non-perception. But you're still there. And Prince Siddhartha not satisfied. And you know how he find out, how he go into meditation to discover this jail keeper and the prison? He remember when he was eight years old. Sat under the apple, the rose apple tree. He went with his father, the king, to the ceremony called turning the plow, turning the soil, beginning the, the cultivation of the rice field. And he, he was in the field, the sun is so hot, and he saw when people turn plow the, the soil, a lot of animals, you know, insects could die, you cut worms, birds come down, picking the worm to eat, and people are sweat, and he himself also feel exhausted with the, the heat. And Siddhartha was only eight years old, he went to, to under the rose apple tree and sat down. And suddenly he felt all the heat were gone. All exaltation vanished. And he get into the state of my ways. He feels so bliss, so calm and so peace. He remember that time. And Shiranta abandoned all his master and take his own practice. He went to the forest and take his own practice with five more friends. And later on, his friends left him. He also left them. He began to uh, eat again. They practice asceticism, I mean, supple, hard, intense, intensive practice. They eat very little, maybe an apple a day. I don't know whether they have apple in India. It must be something a day, but they don't eat like us. Asceticism means mean you, you try to hunger yourself. You try to put your body in hunger. Because Siddhartha believed that he saw an image that if you use the log of a tree, you know, the log soaked with, you know, with sap, then you cannot burn us, that log. Because it's wet, full of sap, sharp. And he say, if this body is full of, you know, pleasure feeling, you know, joy, happiness come from eating, drinking, then probably it will not make heat, it not make enlightened. It's just like the, the log of wood. If you dry up the log of wood, people burn, it can make fire. But if the log of wood is so wet, full of sap, too much nutrition, you know, too much stuff in there, you cannot burn and give fire. Same thing with the body. If you eat too much, you know, drink a lot of nutrition, uh, drink into the body, you cannot get enlightenment. That's how he, he believed. And that's why he took the path of asceticism, mean try to make the body shrink, make the body put you into hunger, make the body really have nothing left so that can liberate the mind. But he practiced asceticism for six years and he nearly died. But it turned out that he did not get enlightenment. He got even more dark in his mind. 
Yeah, very weak. He struggling a lot. He fighting a lot. He controlling a lot in his mind, but he did not get enlightenment. But to to be fair with the Siddhartha, that he has the gut to do it. He has the will to do it. He is not lazy like us. Yeah. We are a little bit too lazy. We eat too much, we drink too much, we care too much with our body. And if we don't have enough sleep, we begin to worry. You know. So he has the gut to do it. Even though he took the wrong path. He did for six years. Sáu năm khô hẳn rừng già. Until his body like skin and bone. So he changed his path. He began to go down and beg him for food. And he was fainted halfway down from the forest. And luckily, luckily there is a girl. Uh, the girl, she, usually she go to the forest and offer food to the, uh, to the tree. You know, they believe there's, there's spirit in the tree. And when you offer food, the spirit of the tree come out and eat food and milk and all that. And she met Siddhartha fainting and she began she must believe this. This must be a holy man. He must be a, a saint coming from the forest. So instead of offering to the tree, she want to offer to this man who is fit. So she pour meal. Her name is Chuyata. Uh, Chuyata is uh, her name. Chuyata, Chuyata is her name. And Chuyata uh, begin to take food again. That's why his friend left him. But he meditated in his own way without listening to the masters, which is he learned. And he remembered the meditation by the age of eight years old. It's what? What is the meditation he got? Clear, clear, clarity and calm. So if we meditate and if our mind is not clear, something is wrong. Maybe too much, too much thoughts, too much thinking, that's why our mind is not clear. Or we sleep, whether thinking too much or you fall into sleep. We, we meditate a lot, but we have no enlightenment. We don't see anything at all. So there must be something wrong in our practice. And the Buddha used the state of clarity in the mind. Sati, because sati, clarity means sati. Calm means pasadi. This two state of in the mind is so important. Sometimes it's called tranquility. Let's go together. Pasadi is so important. And sati, sati here is mindfulness. Pasati is tranquility. The Buddha, Siddhartha, used this method to meditate. And I'm sure that he used his breath. In, during this time, uh, yogi, they use the, the breathing a lot. Yeah, they don't use evoking the name of the Buddha. They, they use uh, the breath a lot. Sometimes they use mantra, but most of the time they use the breath. And for sure, they don't say the name of the Buddha because there's no, no Buddha yet. They don't even say, don't say any kind of gods. You know, Indian, they believe a lot of gods. Brahma is one god, 
Vishnu is another god, and Shiva is another god. Vishnu is maintaining life. Shiva is destroy life. Brahma is create life. And they even call snake is a god. Stone is a god. Sun is a god. You know, moon is a god. So a lot of gods. But for, for sure, when they meditate, they don't evoke the name of gods or Buddha. So if you belong to the pure land, sorry about that. The Buddha did not get enlightenment under the body tree by evoking the name. But he meditated. He used mindfulness, concentration. This were very similar to concentration. Pasadi. Pasadi very close to Samadhi. Samadhi is concentration. So these are the way the Buddha used, you know, to, to discover his enlightenment. And he saw something, you know, behind this suffering is called ignorance. From ignorance, it brings into attachment, clinging, craving to an idea of self. Because of ignorance, you believe this is me. This body is me. These feelings are me. This perception are me. This mental activity are me. Anger are me. You know, suffering come about. And when the suffering come about, when you also cling to yourself, you also run after sensual pleasure. You run after conflict. Discrimination, racism, all kind of problems. So Buddha called this ignorant it a jailkeeper, and all this is a prison. And he he had a glimpse of you know of opening up something in him that he looking for a long, long time. He saw the jail keeper manifest so many times in his mind. I mean the ignorance. Ignorance is mean you're not, you don't know. There's no light. Ignorance is state of darkness and confusion in your mind. You don't know. You don't know who you are, what you are. You only, you know, follow what they tell you to do. That's why running after sensual desire, running after pride and love, romant, romantic. You want to find, you attach to an ego and you want to find someone who belongs to that ego. That's why couples, they fall in love. They thought they love each other. Actually, they love themselves. They want to find someone to fulfill that. So the behind is the motivation behind of this. All this is self-love. Self-pride. Pride. Now I. Va na. Nama. Self pride, the I. Sometimes we call self pride the I. Somebody say something, you feel hurt. You see, and it's come from this ignorance. You don't know who you are, and you create a false belief called Atma. I am me, me, and me. You see that? And it's not, we, we believe that, the whole system of society believe like that. Our father, our mother believe like that. Our grandfather, grandmother also believe like that. And it's a system of belief. And it's a delusion. Come from ignorant delusion. Avicya, avicya. Ignorant. 
So the Buddha used this mindfulness, deep concentration, and he shine in his mind. And he shine, and what he saw is his five skandhas. Skandhas. His body, feelings, perception, mental formation, formation or activity, it doesn't matter, and consciousness. He saw these five skandhas, they are not a solid thing, they are flow like a river. So the body, the body actually is a river, it's not solid, and it changes constantly. So the first thing he discovered is the law of impermanence. Because the bodies are flows. Nothing belongs, you know, the same, same moment is always changing. It's, it's very true that now we see that our body, you know, flow all the time. When we are young, we are totally different from now. We change all the time, constantly change. But we believe this is my body. Actually, it changed already. It's just like a river. Can you bathe in the river a second time? No. You can only bathe in the river one moment. And the next moment, the new, the new river already. So you thought it's the same river. Actually, it's already gone. All the waters, all the drop of water changed completely. Your body is the same. So that is called impermanent. He discovered life is the process of flowing, change constantly. We suffer because we believe that it's permanent. This is my body. And I don't want to get old. You know, when uh, young people, they always look into the mirror and they see wrinkle and they begin to worry. And they need to go to the cosmetic, you know, try to fix them. So they, they want something permanent, they don't want impermanence, and that is suffering. That is ignorant, avijya. You see, we don't see things as they are, but we believe in impermanence as permanent. Yeah. And same thing with feeling, feeling is like a reverse, it's not a feeling is the reverse of feeling. Sometimes it's pleasant feeling, sometimes it's unpleasant feeling, sometimes it's neutral. Like no, no two days is an, it's a neutral feeling. But actually, it's very pleasant feeling. Believe me, when you get two dead, it's suffering a lot. When you have two dead, it's so much pain. So, no two dead, is actually a, a, a very pleasant feeling, but we call it neutral feeling. So the rivers of feeling are flow moment to moment. Nothing is called, this is my feeling, it's flow. <laughs> so next time if you have unpleasant feeling, don't worry about it, it will flow, it will pass by. Yeah. Don't hesitate, don't get into panic, don't go to get the painkiller, just be aware of it. Maybe get up and do some exercise, yoga, or take a walk, or drink a cup of, uh, you know, fresh water. The suffering, the pain will gone, will gone, for sure. Perceptions, you know, go along with body and feeling, there's perception. And actually perception brings feelings. You know, perception, when you have a perception, you have a feeling. When you see him like that, you also have a feeling with him, about him. Sometimes feelings 
there's some feeling come from the body. Something wrong in the body, the brain creates a feeling right away. But sometimes feeling come from a perception. So these three rivers, you know, intermingle, flowing together. So make sure that you have to guard the perception. Most of the perception is wrong. It's created by our own mind. We call mental discourse. We talk in our, in our, in the heck our, um, our back about this person, about that person. And that's why it brings feelings. And usually it's unpleasant feeling, suffering. But fortunately, perceptions is also, are also at the river, so they will flow. So everything he discovered is the nature of impermanence. So this is the first discovery. Second discovery is impermanence. And he looked deep into the third category, mental formation. Mental formation is including anger, fear, despair, jealousy, you know, anxiety, worry. Most of this mental formation actually is the source of our suffering also. And if we cling to it, we hold on to it, we suffer. And that's why let it flow. Let all the mental activity flow. Yeah. Let anger flow. Don't hold on to anger. Maybe you can do like this. You can talk to the anger. You say, anger, let's breathe. So that the, our mind can be lightened. Hello, anger. Let's breathe, breathe together so that my mind can be lightened. See? And that's where you begin to practice non-attachment, non-clinging, non-craving to one of the thing is mental formation. You begin to have a glimpse of non-self. From, from the notion, from the belief of self, you begin to practice of non-self. And the practice of non-self is to let go of mental formation. Don't identify with it. As me, 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 and also don't suppress. You know, Siddhartha, he also meditated before. And most of his meditation is to suppress all this negative mental formation. You know, going to limitless space is actually to suppress all, everything in the mind. So that I want to make my mind space, limitless space. So anger go away. Stay down there. Like snake, like snake in a state in a hole. Let me be peace, you know. Well, I saw two rattles, rattlesnake the other day. They're really big. Yeah, he's so big, he's this long, and his body is like this. And he's so big, he doesn't rattle anymore. Maybe he's too exhausted. <laughs> so when you practice suppression, it's just like you say, hey, rattlesnake, go down to the hole. Yeah, don't, don't bring me fear and panic, you see. So we have to say, you know, hello to mental formation, to anger, to fear, to anxiety, to sorrow, you know, and say, breathe with me and let my mind, you know, lighten, calm, consciousness. So the practice here is the practice of not suppression, but not identify with it, and clinging, craving to anything in our mind. Hey, say hello to anger. Breathe with anger. And sometimes you breathe with anger, it doesn't work, it's overwhelming, walk with anger. You know, we live in a society where people are full of violence and anger. So we need to take care of these mental states. It's like volcano, you know. And consciousness. The third thing that he, the Buddha discovered is what? He looked into his body and he see 
all kind of thing in it. This body contains organic, inorganic living beings. It contains minerals, you know. It has things like stars, you know, material like the stars. It has the river, has the air, the mountain, all living beings in it. And it also including the stream of ancestors. So, I'm going to draw this for you to understand a little bit what the, the Buddha discovered. Very important. The, this is the last discover of the Buddha under the Bodhi tree, and he got, you know, enlightened. He's totally free from his suffering. This is a symbol of me, of consciousness. And the Buddha saw that in him there is a river, a flow, the current of flow into, through him. These are like the stream of life, the, the river of life. You know, everything, everyone in this manifest in this planet Earth, it comes from, from this river. You can call, you know, the um, nowadays science they call the the string theory. String theory is the connection between the three quarks, you know. This is a deeper teaching of uh, quantum level, quantum physics. String theory. Or you can call fog fields. Fog field is, is a field of, uh, of only energy. And we, Buddhism we call uh, the river, the river of life. Yang Sung Nip Lak. The river of life. And from there, you manifest appear. So look into it, your, your life, body and mind. You see all kind of living being in it, organic or inorganic. You see material thing, you see mineral, you see living, living being in it. Living sentient being and non sentient being. You see, the cell of your body contains the cell of your, your father, your mother, your ancestor. So, stream of ancestor, you know, flow through you. And the Buddha called this is a non self. The inside of non self. Not a separate existence. This body and mind, this life of me is actually not a separate existence, but it's interconnected, deeply interconnected with the river. So you can image this is an infant. You are like an infant, you know, like in your, the womb of your mother, right? He has a little eyes here. And at the, the navel, it connects to invisible, invisible imperial coat. You don't see this, but it's deeply connected. To what? To the river, to the mountain, to the air, to the sun to your family tree, family tree, and so on. And you actually connect it to the whole universe. So when you see the baby Buddha, you know, you see the baby Buddha statue, his one hand is raised up in the sky, another hand is pointed out to the earth, is I am connected to the earth, and I am connected deeply connect to the whole universe. 
That's the symbol of the start. I'm not a separate existence. I am, you know, belong to this river, river supply. And it's called non self. <coughs> so the teaching of impermanent and non self is the basic discovery of the Buddha under the Bodhi tree. If there's no self, who is suffering? If this body is not you, who is beautiful and who is ugly? Because you believe this is me. That's why you worry too much about how you look. Is that right? But if this body, this, this look is belong to your grandmother, you know, one lady, she changed her face so much. She do cosmetic for many times. And one day she came back and to visit her grandmother. Her grandmother could not recognize her. You see? So actually the grandmother lost completely the grandchild, grandgirl, grandbaby, you know, because she do too much cosmetic. <laughs> she changed totally because she doesn't like herself. She doesn't like doesn't like how she looks. So he, she make her eyes bigger, she put longer eye, eye legs, she draw her own eyebrows, <laughs> and all that stuff. She make her lip bigger, thicker. So grandma could not see it. But the Buddha discovered that you only manifest from the stream, the river of life. You are not you. The way you look actually is the product of many generations before. How they live their life. The way you feel is the product of your father and your mother. At least. So if you say, I don't like my father, it doesn't work with this inside. <laughs> you actually your father even though you don't like him. Because one day, when you become a father, you behave like him, totally like him. You see, so that is called the, the teaching of non-self. This body is not me. Yeah. And how I look, it's just, you know, the gift of life, the gift of my family, you know, my, my family tree, you know. That's how they live. That's how they, you know, they see about beauty and they transmit it to me. You know, sometimes I saw a beautiful lady, but without cosmetic. <laughs> and I see that kind of beauty, it draw me in more than, you know, red lips, you know, and a lot of, you know, perfume. Sometimes I don't feel happy with perfuming. I walk through a lady and she put too much perfume in, I'm feeling like exhausted. <laughs> so the natural look sometimes is more beautiful than, you know, the fake one. <laughs> the one that you create, you make it up, you cosmetic. Yeah. So look into your body, look into your feeling. This is not me. Maybe this sadness belonged to my mother. She was sad. And she carried me in the back up, you know, while she are cooking, while she are doing the gardening, while she working in the field, and her sadness go into my body. So look into like this, you understand the teaching of non -self. And sometimes this teaching it called interdependent, interdependent cause arising. This is very important discover of the Buddha. Actually, this is the real discover of the Buddha. Interdependent cause arising. So there's nothing called independent. 
That is nothing called independent. It should be interdependent co-arising. Because actually, we're deeply connected. Can you be independent by yourself to survive? No. You need air, you need water, you need food, you need school, you need love, you need your father, your mother. You need the mineral, you need the earth. You need the farmer, you need the shopper, you need the driver, truck driver. They bring food into, into your house. So interdependent co-arising. This is the wisdom of the Buddha. This is because that is. This is me because there is something not me it bring into me. So self, it make up non-self elements. So remember the image of the, the infant. You connect invisible cords to sun, family tree, air, mountain, river, rain, stars, and whole universe. Remember that. This is how the Buddha get enlightened. If there is no self, who is complaining? Who is suffering? Who is sickness? And who is death? If there is no self, who is dying? So you ask yourself, ask your, your grandmother, Grandmother, are you really dying? Are you really passing away? No. Grandma is in you. It's just like my mother. She passed away in 2014. Is really my mother died? No, my mother is in me. You know, I am here. This moment proved that my mother is still there somewhere. In every cell of my body. So this hand is actually the signature of my, my mother. True signature of my mother, she is there in me. Can you believe if my mother is not there, am I, will be, can I be here for you? No. So my mother actually never died. She only hide, you know. After the, the manifestation, you know, disappear, when condition is not enough, this manifestation disappear, you go back to the fog fields, you go back to the river of life. And you continue to flow. So life is a flow. Life is not a self. Life is not a rock, a solid rock, a separate rock exists. Remember that. Life is to dance, to flow with the inside of interconnectedness, interdependent co-arising. The term is too vague to understand, but actually this is because of that. I am make only my, my mother, my father, my family tree, the river, the sun, the air, the whole universe. So when you nearly die, you will have to visualize that. Visualize you are an infant connected to the whole cosmos. And who is going to die? If there is no self, who is dying? No dying. So the deepest fear, deep fear, the most strongest prison is the net of birth and death. The net of fear, a delusion created by the delusion there is birth and death. There is samsara, you know, the vicious cycle of birth and death. That's imprisoned us so many lifetimes. And it comes from ignorance, comes from clinging to a self, me, me, me. Therefore, one day I have to die. Therefore, one day I have to abandon the people I love. They pass away because of the notion of this is me and this people belong to me. And I don't want them to die. I don't want to die. You see, the jail keeper is ignorance. And no insight, only darkness. 
only wrong belief of an Atma. Remember, wrong belief of an Atma creates all suffering. Do you remember Atma? Me, me, and me. And that's why I fight with my husband. You know, I complain, I blame each other. You know, I demanding, I controlling. I controlling each other, you know. Me, me, and me. Atma. The Buddha destroyed the wrong belief of Atma. And he destroyed, he destroyed the, the wrong belief of Atman. Belief of the whole system in India at that time. Atman is a very strong belief. And one day, I will join Brahman. Brahman is big cell. Atman is small cell. And Buddha said, there's no Atma. Atnata. Atnata means no self. Atnata. And today is the birthday of the Buddha. Actually, today is the Buddha Enlightenment Day. And you know what he got enlightenment. So don't, don't just talk about enlightenment as a very, very theme, but you have to know what he got enlightenment under the Bodhi tree and what kind of meditation he used. Don't evoke in somebody's name, remember that. The Buddha didn't name, evoke any name. He do the breathing. He used sati, mindfulness, and general power of mindfulness into the power of concentration, and he shine that light into the five skandha and saw it's always flowing, impermanent. And there is none a separate existence in it. Nothing left. It's just like, you know, when you open the banana tree, you open leaf after leaf, you peel the banana tree, there's nothing left at the, you know, at the core of the banana tree. Okay, next time you op you peel the, the orange, I mean, not the orange, the, what's that, the onion, you peel layer after layer in the coat, then you're nothing left. Same thing like you. If you remove all the cells, you know, all the bonding, atomic bonding of the cell, there's nothing left. There's nothing called Brother Minh Hoa or Brother Minh Yung at all. See, the body is like that, but the feeling like that is nothing left. Why? Because we come from non-self. We are the rivers flowing all the time. We are not a solid thing called, a separate existence called self. Thank you very much for your listening.